You're heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 115, covering the week of April 2nd through April 6th, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program. Glad to be here. Before we get started, just want to remind you that you can follow the Abbeville Institute on social media. You can uh, like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube page. All of those social media buttons are at the top of our page. Just go to abbevilleinstitute.org. You'll find all those buttons there. Also, while you're at abbevilleinstitute.org, give us an email address, and we will give you a free ebook, book Kirkpatrick Sales Emancipation Hell. You'll also get our Daily Dose of Dixie, Monday through Friday, and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. While you're at our webpage, you can also help support the Abbeville Institute at the top of the page. You'll see a little button that says support. Click on that, and it'll have donor options. You can donate monthly or annually for as little as 3 bucks a month or $5 a month if you're not a student. You can help help us uh, support our mission, uh, or for $25 a year or $50 a year if you're, if you're interested in an annual donation. You can help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Also, at the top of the page, you'll see a little button that has the Amazon symbol on it. Click on that. You can make us your preferred charity. And every time you shop at Amazon.com, you'll help the Abbeville Institute. And don't forget that we have uh, merchandise, apparel for sale. Uh, If you go to the webpage at the top of the page where it says support, there's a little button that says shop. Click on that. It'll take you out. You can get your embroidered Abbeville Institute apparel, shirts, hats, uh, fleece jackets, everything you would want to have uh, to ha- that has our logo on it. And, of course, you can download our free app. Just going out to your favorite web store, application store, whether it's on uh, Apple or Google, and you can get the Abbeville Institute app where you can get this podcast as well as our lectures, and it also is our mobile platform for the website. So go on out and get all those things. We've got a lot of cool stuff and a lot of things going on, and you're going to want those things and your daily Abbeville Institute life. So get your daily dose of Dixie, get your daily dose of Abbeville Institute, and help us explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Okay, all of that said, we had a, uh, an interesting week at the Institute. In fact, the, this week was all about the New South. And one way or another, every article we ran discussed the New South. And so we started with uh, a piece that um, had to do with the current situation in New Orleans. Of course, Mayor Landrieu is leaving office after two terms, He's being succeeded by another uh, mayor who is probably going to be as anti-Confederate uh, statue as Mayor Landry was. And, of course, Landry has been on the talk show circuit recently because he had a book published. Uh, he was also on CBS's 60 Minutes uh, within the last few weeks talking about the Confederate monuments. And this particular piece by Gail Jarvis lets him have it. And it lets him have it for a very specific reason. Um, and I'll, I'll just quote the piece. He says, Quote, as Mitch Landrieu's two terms as New Orleans mayor ends, he leaves behind a city characterized by rampant crime, unsafe streets and neighborhoods, and an understaffed, unsupported police force that had to be augmented by state troopers. In addition to its unimaginable or unmanageable crime problem, excuse me, the city suffers from high employment, a decaying infrastructure, inadequate drainage, sidewalks and streets with potholes and cavens, a dysfunctional sewer and water board, and a failed educational system. So, all the money that was spent to remove Confederate statues, all the publicity that was out there. And essentially, Jarvis says, look, the only reason he did this is to gain national attention so he could maybe run for president. All of that was to mask the real issues in New Orleans, the real problems in New Orleans, which have only gotten worse as we've had, or as uh, Gail Jarvis, who is a resident of New Orleans, um, says, you know, these are issues that have not been addressed for years. I mean, he's going back to before Hurricane Katrina. So you're talking about over a decade, and the city has continued to decline. Now, Landry makes the point that this has happened because people were upset with these Confederate statues. But the citizens of New Orleans, as uh, Jarvis points out at the end of the article, he says, um, he says, contrary to the impression given by the national news, there was and is considerable local opposition to the removal of the New Orleans monuments. Preservation organizations like the Monument Task Committee implored the seven-member city council not to act unilaterally and rightfully demanded that the removal decision be put to a vote by the public. This is something that Landrieu refused to do. The council refused as well. Local college professors also voiced their objection to the elimination of century-old heritage memorials, and an organization of black ministers, pastors for a better New Orleans, objected to the removals. 
So you had a number of people in New Orleans, black and white, saying that uh, these things should stay where they are. This is masking the issues of New Orleans and some of the problems we have here. And, of course, all of the mistruths and lies about the monuments have been spread by Landrieu and others. Uh, in one particular case, he points out that some people have said these monuments went up in the 1960s. Uh, it, almost every monument went up long before that. In fact, usually around the 50th anniversary of the war, uh, between 1890, between the, the 30th and 50th anniversary of the war, 25th, I should say, and 50th anniversary, between 1890s and, of course, uh, the end of World War I. And so th these ceremonies were attended by people north and south. This was a grand time of reconciliation in the United States, and really it's, that's what this is all about. It's an attack on reconciliation. It's an attack on the idea that north and south should hold, should cross the chasm, shake hands and say, look, we're all Americans, and let's move on with things. You have your monuments, we have ours. I've gone over this several times on this podcast but the the important thing to note is that the uh, the effort by Landrieu and others is again masking problems in New Orleans. The monuments became a, a convenient way of uh, shielding the poor leadership of Landrieu and also the terrible economic and social situations in New Orleans that need to be addressed that aren't being addressed because people were focused on some monuments. Um, it's it's actually kind of silly, but this is what the New South is all about today uh, in a lot of ways. Now, it hasn't always been that way. In fact, there was a time in the New South when Southerners uh, were well-respected by Americans all over and, and by people all over the world. Um, and so a couple of pieces have to do with the South in the 1930s and just before that. Uh, and then a couple pieces with the South in the 1940s. So let's talk about these two pieces with the South in the 1930s. The Tuesday, we ran a short little book review of I'll Take My Stand by uh, Randall Ivey. And uh, this review was actually published on uh, Amazon, I believe, and back in the early 2000s. But we ran it here because it's a nice little review. And if you have not ever read I'll Take My Stand, if you have never read it, um, it's, uh, it's one of the books that you should read if you are a Southerner. In fact, I'll never forget, and we've talked about this book again on this podcast when I was in graduate school, it was assigned in a New South course, and uh, there was a, a guy in that class. He was, uh, you know, kind of a progressive uh, hippie type guy. He was uh, very interested in environmentalism. He was what you would call a modern green. He loved this book, and he loved the book because it was a defense of an agrarian society. It was a critique on industrial capitalism, and that is what the Abbeville Institute is all about. When it comes down to it, not that critique, but finding what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. We explore that. And so there are things that the Southern tradition, this agrarian tradition, which has been carried forward from Jefferson's time to our own, that offer to America that we should be thinking about. Monuments uh, that are dedicated to the best individuals in Southern society. Uh, Booker T. Washington even said, hey, look, monuments that go up to the best individuals should go up. Uh, the best individuals in Southern society, we should respect these people, and we should, we should applaud these people for being of good character. And that's what this is about. Robert E. Lee was recognized all over the world, but particularly in the United States, North and South, as a fine example of a true Southern gentleman. And it's only been recently that his reputation has been tarnished and in fact, uh, back in the, there was a, a, I've talked about this book before, Albion Seed by David Hackett Fisher. He actually points, he, he, he connects the dots between George Washington, Robert E. Lee, and George Marshall. Uh, and he says all these men represented the best of Southern society, the best of Virginia society, and Virginia produced men of great character. George Washington and Robert E. Lee were of the same cloth. And so, uh, to demonize these individuals means that you're going to have to demonize George Washington. You're going to have to demonize Thomas Jefferson or James Madison. And, of course, there are people that plainly say that's what we're going to do. The uh, Confederate statue is a low-hanging fruit. Once you take those down, you're going to go after something else. You're going to go after some element of the South or of American history, traditional Western civilization. Whatever the case may be, they will come under attack. And so this is what's at stake in this entire process. And... Uh, this book, you know, I'll take my stand, is designed to put in the fore the Southern tradition and, again, what is important about that. 
uh, how the Southern tradition was important for America and its critique of industrial capitalism, what that was doing. And one of the pieces that will, the piece that corresponds with this uh, in, in the South in the 20s and 30s brings that up and, and was attack. One of the one of the uh, articles was an attack on science, not necessarily attack on science, but how science was being used as a weapon, and that religion and science were not incompatible things. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that when we get to that article. But if you've never read, I'll take my stand. If you don't understand that part of the Southern tradition, this agrarian tradition, which uh, in some in so many ways takes apart the consumerism of modern American society, uh, which takes apart the uh, really lack of culture in modern American society, and it's it's an affirmation of Southern culture and its its importance as a lens through which to view America, then you're missing out. And you can get, it's not expensive, you can get it in paperback form. Uh, if you've never read it, you should go out there and read that book. And in that same tone, we had a piece on Wednesday entitled Re- Reconsidering William Jennings Bryan. Now, this is an interesting piece. Bryan was not a Southerner, though uh, his family was originally from Virginia. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a little living history town which is being moved from uh, Lumpkin, Georgia, to Columbus, Georgia, entitled Westville, it's, it's was called. Uh, it was actually established in the 1970s. Jimmy Carter was there when it was unveiled. and uh, It's this 1850s living history town, and there's a house. It's the Bryan House there, and it's the same family as William Jennings Bryan. Uh, now, I don't know if they're gonna, where, if they're, where they're going to put that house, if they're going to have all the buildings from Westville moved, but certainly it was, it was one of my favorite uh, homes there. And the in the uh, little town, and they had a representation of southern homes from the smallest little log cabins you could find, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, just little homesteads, up in, uh, including plantation homes. Uh, and they had a courthouse, they had shops, they had uh, they did have slave quarters, they had everything that was representative of the South in the 1850s. And it's a wonderful little place. It was the Southern Williamsburg, uh, you know, even though Williamsburg is in the South, but you know, Yankees had co-opted that and made that. This is this is uh, you know, this is national. This is uh, these are good Americans here. Uh, but this was a, an 1850s version of Williamsburg, and it's a wonderful little place. And they're moving it to have perhaps get a, a higher profile. Uh, you know, all these living history museums are struggling. That is one thing. If you do live and you do listen to this podcast. Go to your museums, uh, particularly the ones that um, do a good job of interpretation. A lot of local museums have that. Uh, and, and go to these uh, you know, historic homes uh, because it's very hard for these things to stay afloat, particularly with the generation of Americans, younger generation of Americans that aren't really interested in this stuff as much anymore. Uh, they just don't go to historic homes. They don't go, they don't, uh, go to these. Uh, Williamsburg is suffering, and, and Williamsburg is where I decided I want to do history. I mean, this is a it's a, such an important place, and for understanding uh, American history, but also Southern history as well. So go to these places; they really are valuable contributions to American society. Uh, but Brian uh, is not often considered lumped in with with the South, uh, and he's often portrayed as kind of this uh, enemy of. Uh, you know, good cons- the good conservative South, even though the South voted in crushing majorities for Bryan when he was the Democratic nominee uh, for president. And in the book that I wrote with Clyde Wilson, Forgotten Conservatives in American History, I, I wrote a chapter on the Lindberghs of Minnesota. And Bryan was like the Lindberghs. Uh, the Lindberghs, of course, were Republicans. C.A. Lindbergh was a Republican, Bryan a Democrat. But they were both part of this northern agrarianism. So they had a lot in common with um, the men who wrote I'll Take My Stand. In fact, as Michael Martin points out in this piece, you could find where the two crossed over. Um, And one of those areas, of course, was uh, in terms of religion. And he says, um, quote, uh, this is what Martin says, quote, Most of Brian's criticism stems from his anti-evolution stance. Now, this is criticism from the left. They tend to like his positions on, say, uh, you know, progressivism, uh, when you look at what government should do. Uh, Brian is often characterized as moving the Democrat Party left. Uh, but they're very critical of Brian and his views on religion. And, of course, he points out that the 1960s uh, dramatic film Inherit the Wind saw, as he says, Brian portrayed as a backward, Bible-thumping bumpkin. 
But if you look at what John Crow Ransom uh, wrote in I'll Take My Stand that in the chapter of the Cult of Science, the two are very similar in what Brian was saying. Martin says Brian was not against science, but actually argued that science and religion do not have to consistently be in conflict. This is the same thing Blaise Pascal was writing back uh, you know, uh, several hundred years ago. Uh, they're not in conflict. Uh, Brian said, as Martin quotes, the Christian men and women of Tennessee know how deeply mankind is indebted to science for its benefits conferred by the discovery of the laws of nature and by designing of machinery for, util- for the utilization of these laws. The contribution that science can make to labor is a re- as to render it easier by the help of a tool or a process and to assure the laborer of his perfect economic security while he's engaged to it. And so he says, uh, Martin says, neither Brian nor the agrarians had a problem with science. But they had a problem with evolution because it's not real science, it's theories. And as he points out, evolution, the use of evolution, uh, the survival of the fittest, which is Herbert Spencer, not not Darwin, but uh, the uh, race-driven view of Darwinism. Uh, the perfection of man and the perfection of races. This is where progressivism and Darwinism com- combined, and you had this in the 20th century, uh, and where Brian was saying this is where this is where evolution is wrong because it doesn't allow man to have his human dignity. Um, if you're going to go out and say that uh, you know Darwinism is true and evolution is true, then there should be a perfect man, and therefore you're going to have people that aren't perfect for whatever reason which is every human being, fall behind. And therefore, that justifies uh, some of the horrible things that happened in the 20th century. Uh, You look at uh, the rise of Nazism and other things. This is all part of Darwinism. It's all part of progressivism. And so this is exactly what uh, the agrarians were against. They were against, against the rise of fascism, and they talked a lot about that. They didn't want fascism. That's what you get into if you believed in an industrial society. You're going to get to fascism. And they said, this is wrong. Ransom uh, said this, and as Martin points out, Ransom believed industrialism was robbing us of our balanced relationship with nature. Ransom wrote, quote, religion can hardly expect to flourish in an industrial society, but nature industrialized, transformed into cities and artificial habitations, manufactured into commodities, is no longer nature, but a highly simplified picture of nature. We receive the illusion of having power over nature and lose the sense of nature as something mysterious and contingent. This is what the agra- northern agrarians were saying as well. This is what Lindbergh, now Lindbergh was often characterized as being a communist. What he really was against was industrial capitalism. This is Wendell Berry. This is Jeffersonianism. And so when I wrote that chapter, a lot of people, oh, you can't. I mean, he was a red. This guy was a communist. But if you look at what he was saying, um, if you look at what he was saying, you're very much pulling a Jeffersonian vision of America from that. And that's what's true and valuable. Paul was true and valuable in the Southern tradition. It's the part that uh, is so important to hang on to. And so this very southern critique of America was still in the fore of the American experience into the 1930s. And into the 1940s, people still recognized southerners and the southern tradition as having an important part of America. And so the last two pieces actually have to do with the World War II generation and uh, what was going on during World War II. And the first uh, is a piece by uh, John Marcourt, our resident scholar in Japan, the Arkansas Traveler. And this is about uh, a long-forgotten southern named Bob Burns. He was from Arkansas. And uh, Burns was one of the most popular radio personalities in America in the 1940s. And then later on, he was on television shows. He appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show in 1955. He died in 1956. But he was an entertainer. He was a comedian. And people loved the Bob Burns Show. And people loved his, his Arkansas Traveler Show. And he was a true Southerner. In fact, 
People love this show so much, and they love Bob Burns so much, that during World War II, they uh, named one of the most famous uh, implements of war after a instrument Bob Burns invented. So everyone knows this. It's, an, it's the M1 shoulder-fired anti-tank rocket launcher, but we call it the bazooka. And the bazooka was the instrument that Bob Burns used on his radio program and on things like the Ed Sullivan show or, or you know, on his, and his television appearances. He used this thing uh, as this funny kind of instrument, but it looked like a rocket launcher. And so that's why they called it the bazooka, because here everyone's saying, yeah, you know, we got this instrument. This Bob Burns guy is really great. And Bob Burns, as Jack points out, was a true son of the South. Uh, his grandfather was born in South Carolina, and he traveled to Tuscaloosa, which was the Alabama state capital, and then he moved on from there. Um, he saw uh, saw start action in the Mexican War. Um, after the war, he returned to Tuscaloosa and then became a shoemaker. Uh, and then uh, Bob Burns' father was born in, in 1851. Uh, they moved to Arkansas. Uh, so he was the son of a Confederate veteran, in other words. Uh, so this was uh, this was very important. Uh, the Southern tradition was very important to Bob Burns. He was he was born in that culture, and that's what made him so interesting to people because he had a real culture. He had a real culture and something to uh, to speak about. You, real comedy, real music, real literature, all born in a real culture. Faulkner is so good because he was born in a real culture, and he and he and he spoke about a real culture, even though his town in Mississippi was a fictional place. It was based on real people. That's what makes good art, whether it's comedy, whether it's television, whether it's music, whether it's literature. Real people and real culture makes good art. And this is what the agrarians were speaking about, that that's all going to be erased if you have industrial capitalism. In so many ways, American culture is just, it's, it's something that doesn't really even exist anymore. It's, it's entertainment which has no basis to it. This is why nobody can come up with anything really good anymore for film or literature or television. It's why everything's being retread, because they can't find anything new to do, because there's no real culture. Comedy comes from real people in real situations, and Southerners were good at this stuff. And so people like to listen to them. You know, Will Rogers was a real person from Oklahoma, and his form of humor was resonated with people because he spoke about real things. And, of course, Will Rogers was, in many ways, unapologetically Southern. So the Southern tradition is such an important part. The New South it was such an important part of American culture really up until the last half of the 20th century as even, well, I, I say I take that back, into the 1970s and 80s it still was an important part of America. The Dukes of Hazard. it's only been the last 20 years this, this is, the attempt has been to erase this for replace it with what? Uh, no one really knows except uh, something that is uh, universally accepted, whatever that is. So we don't really have a culture anymore. That's and This is why comedy isn't as good, television isn't as good, the literature is not as good, the art's not as good, the music's not as good. All these things, uh, it's just packaged. Uh, you know, if you look at country music, for example, mainstream country music, it's just, uh, you know, pop music with a twang. That's all it is. Now, there is real country music out there, but the mainstream stuff, the stuff that's on your radio, it's just pop music with the twang. And so that's why uh, someone like Chris Stapleton comes in, if we're just speaking of country music, comes in and makes such a, a, a triumphant career very quickly because it's real. I mean, you look at his songs, they're real songs about real people and real places and real things. And that's why people like it so much. It's uh, not some kind of bubblegum pop music. With a twang. And last but not least, the piece on Friday entitled uh, Okinawa Confederate Flag talks about how this is by Philip Lee. And um, if you've never gone to his blog, we actually have a link to his blog out there. And, and uh, get on his email list. He, he writes great emails and uh, he's a great author. Pick up his books. He just had a new uh, book come out through Shotwell Press on 
uh, Gangsters in the South. I can't remember the title of it, but um, it's on the uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas connection to organized crime. It's very interesting. Uh, and uh, that part of this new Southern history, it's, it's an important part of it, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly in that particular case. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, he's, he's a very good author. His book on Reconstruction, I can't speak enough about it, Southern Reconstruction, very good. Go on out and pick that up, too. Uh, and he wrote this article about uh, there's some blogs out there that uh, like to make fun of Southerners who uh, all the time. I mean, it's, it's, uh, this is what they do. And uh, one of the things they like to do is point out that uh, Southerners make stuff up about the Confederate flag. And they had a picture of, uh, you know, a flag raising and they they used uh, photoshop to put a battle flag in it and said oh this is just funny these people are just uh they're just making stuff up but as we've talked about on this podcast and as lee points out uh their southerners did fly confederate flags in world war ii and they've been used throughout american wars uh, even into the current conflicts and um he says that, you know, five days ago I posted an article, which we linked to, citing Eugene Sledge's With the Old Breed that stated the first American flag to fly over the conquered Japanese fortress uh, during World War II at the Battle of Okinawa was the Confederate battle flag. Sledge, who was present, wrote, Earlier in the morning, May 29, 1949, Marines had attacked eastward into the, into the rains of Shuri Castle and raised the Confederate flag. When we learned that the flag of the Confederacy had been hoisted over the very heart and soul of Japanese resistance, all of us Southerners cheered loudly, the Yankees among us grumbled. And, of course, Eugene Sledge being from Alabama, he was the sledgehammer. And um, this was corroborated. Um, this was corroborated uh, by several individuals. Um, and he gets into the story of how this flag was raised. And, yeah, maybe the Yankees grumbled, but this shows that Southerners are very proud of this flag. Um, very proud of the fact that uh, you know, this this was their flag going into war, and they were proud Americans, but they were also very proud of where they were from. And uh, as uh, Lee points out, forty percent uh, of our troops come from the South, even today, with fifteen percent from the Northeast. So Southerners are still disproportionately represented in uh, the United States Armed Services, and they're proud of where they're from. Uh, and that battle flag was seen as that, you know, it's uh, it's seen as a representation of Southern culture and Southern pride to these individuals, not as anything else. Here they are at Okinawa. They've just uh, taken a stronghold, bloody battle, uh, and they're there saying, hey, we're proud to be Southern. This is our flag, too. This is everyone's flag. This is an American flag. I love how Lee says the first, quote, American flag to be put up at Okinawa was the Confederate battle flag not the United States flag. And, of course, Southerners were just as fine in World War II with that flag flying, too. It's just a representation. Hey, this is this is what they had. And he gets into the story of why they had this flag. Uh, and so they put it up. Here we go. We got an American flag right here. Let's fly this one. It's a shame that uh, within 70 years, that flag is now seen as anti-American. It's equated with... Uh, the, the ir irony of that is that this flag is now somehow lumped in with the Nazi swastika. Here are American soldiers going into battle during World War II, fighting the Axis powers, hoisting a Confederate battle flag in opposition to the Axis. And yet somehow those two are now intertwined? It just doesn't make any sense. You've got the 12 Southerners railing against fascism because that's what they said was coming if you uh, believed in this industrial society, yet somehow the Southern tradition is fascism? Again, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, these people were very concerned. Southerners are very concerned in the 20th century about the drift towards these radical progressive ideologies like fascism and how that could destroy America. And here are these men dying in World War II, hoisting an American flag, which was the Confederate battle flag. Uh, we have come a long way in seven years downhill. And unfortunately, in, in terms of the view of um, uh, these symbols and how they represented you know, pride in a section and a people and how now how they're represented in America. And unfortunately, that's because these symbols have been co-opted by 
uh, groups that, and as Gail Jarvis pointed out on Monday, that uh, destroyed them. But that doesn't mean that the symbol lost its meaning for most of the people that use that symbol or enjoy that symbol or enjoy Confederate statues or whatever the case may be, the the Southern tradition, which is what we try to do. So um, look at the New South, and I, I've, I've implored people you know, before, if you're looking at Southern history, do some New South topics. They're really interesting. They add uh, to the dialogue about what the South is and why it's important and parts of the Southern tradition that are true and valuable. Of course, every tradition has bad things. And uh, we don't we don't advance those things, but we do want to talk about the things that still offer value to America today, and that agrarian critique still offers value. The uh, fact that these Southerners, very brave Southerners, went and put up a Confederate battle flag in World War II, that still offers value, uh, because these men were heroic, and uh, they simply admired people like Lee, good representations of character in American history. Until next time, good day.